We hear a lot about cursed films around horror productions. It's definitely a curious thing that people gravitate to, you know, crazy things that happen on the set of The Exorcist. The Omen. You know, I remember watching Poltergeist, and I remember my parents telling me, oh, that little girl died. And I was like, oh my God. I remember hearing the stories about Poltergeist. The lore was introduced to me long before the film was. Um, and so I almost felt like I had seen the movie because I had heard about all of the kind of cursed things that had happened on set. Most people, when you hear of Poltergeist, probably think, oh yeah, that's that film that was kind of cursed. And then you enter the internet into that and forget about it. It's off and skyrocketing and it has a life of its own now. It will never go away. There's a series of mishaps that happen that well, believers will say uh, mean that there's a poltergeist curse. For example, on the set of the film, the little boy, when he's being strangled by the toy clown, the mechanism malfunctioned and he claims he was actually being choked out. One of the stories that come out of the original poltergeist, which had a lot of tragic stories surrounding it and a lot of deaths, was Jill Beth Williams in a muddy pool full of skeletons. If you need skeletons to come out of a muddy pool, what do you do? Well, get some real ones, I guess. Some people think maybe the skeletons in the pool at the end of the movie were actually real skeletons from India. The poltergeist curse is often attributed to these rumors that they used real skeletons from India, and this is blasphemous, and they've desecrated these bodies, and it led to a curse. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but I, I tend to believe that is true because those skeletons do look pretty good. There are a number of crazy things that happen throughout the making of the three poltergeist films, but there are two primary reasons why people believe the films were cursed. The deaths of Heather O'Rourke and Dominique tea. Dunn. Oh, brother. Dominic Dunn was the daughter of Dominic Dunn, who was a very famous writer for Vanity Fair. He made a name for himself covering many of the famous murder trials of the 1990s. Her older brother was Griffin Dunn, who had made a number of movies. Did you hear that? Dominic Dunn was in a relationship with John Sweeney, who was the sous chef for Wolfgang Puck. One evening, Dominic had been beaten up by John Sweeney, and so she broke off the relationship. <laughs> Poltergeist had already been released and was a big hit. And John Sweeney showed up at her house in Los Angeles and got into a fight with her and began to strangle her. He did not at that time kill her. She then remained in a coma for four or five days and then she was taken off life support. Dominic Dunn had the idea to write about his daughter's murder and the subsequent trial for Vanity Fair. The judge ruled against the prosecution in almost every way possible. For example, John Sweeney had beaten up a girlfriend previous to Dominic Dunn, and that was not allowed in court. It looked as though John Sweeney, under some kind of a plea bargain, would get 10 years in prison. That would have been better because he ended up spending two and a half years in, in prison. So after Poltergeist, Dummy Dunn is murdered by her boyfriend. I think that doesn't pick up a lot of cursed heat at the time, but then in Poltergeist 2, Will Sampson, an actor in the film, who was also a shaman, was allowed on set after hours to perform an exorcism to try to rid the production of its demons. Two years after the release of Poltergeist 2, Will Sampson, that same actor who performed the exorcism, died of kidney failure and malnutrition at age 53. Okay, that one, he's young. That could be a curse. God is in. And then to add to this list, Julian Beck, who played the cult leader, the old scary man that they used in a lot of the marketing for the film. Even if you haven't seen the film, you're probably aware of this guy. You are gonna die! 
he died of stomach cancer as well. Sorry to see. You're still unconvinced. When I accepted to do Poltergeist 3, I was aware of the fact that there had been deaths on the previous two films. I think the only thing that brought about any feelings of a curse or anything was we had to recreate one of the characters in the film because the actor, Julian Beck, had died, and we wanted to bring back the character of Reverend Kane, so they used the death mask of um, Julian Beck to make the prosthetics for Nate Davis so that Nate would look like Julian. They called it a death mask, whether the casting was done while Julian was alive or after he died, I'm not sure. It was a little creepy. I'm Matthew Hudson. I'm a science writer, and I'm the author of The Seven Laws of Magical Thinking, How Irrational Beliefs Keep Us Happy, Healthy, and Sane. Magical thinking is basically belief in the supernatural. Things like luck, destiny, mind over matter, life after death or the belief that objects carry essences. This is the law of contagion. It's the idea that mental properties, like personality or good and evil, can be transmitted through contact. So a great example of this is the story of the Red Sox jersey buried under Yankee Stadium. Following a lengthy curse that hung over his beloved Red Sox baseball team, a Boston fan hatched his own devious plot, bury a Red Sox jersey in the foundation of the new Yankee Stadium. He went to the construction site for Yankee Stadium and brought with him a jersey for David Ortiz, who is a star on the Red Sox. And he put this jersey in the wet cement, thinking that he would curse the stadium. And the next year, the Yankees found out about it. And so people were calling for this thing to be removed, and they had to jackhammer it out of two feet of concrete. They ripped the concrete apart today at the new Yankee Stadium, and there it was, wedged in there. Yep, that's it. The infamous Red Sox jersey buried by a construction worker. They pulled this jersey out of the cement and held it up under the flashing bulbs. It was like a magical rite, like a cleansing ceremony. It felt very tribal. We infuse inanimate objects with agency, and our brains are just really good at that. We know from research by cognitive psychologists that if you offer subjects the opportunity to wear Hitler's jacket, they don't want to do it. There's evil in the object itself, almost as if the evil is floating in the ether, and it just infuses into a body, a person, a jacket, an article. Anything associated with a horror film, the house, the set, a prop, of course it's going to have that kind of sense like there's something evil lurking within, in the walls or in the object. There's something therapeutic about owning the things that frightened you. I just am a fan of the art. You know, some people collect paintings. I collect props. So this is my toy slash prop room. This is years and years of collecting right here. And a few bucks as well. <laughs> a lot of screen used masks, various Halloween films. It's very important for me to have screen used stuff versus just replicas. The screen used stuff, I mean, it's so rare and you're like one of a small portion of people that may have one. They only did one of these Frankenstein masks and I have it. It is kind of crazy to think who has handled these things, who's worn them, who's touched them. The legacy they carry, it makes them special and it also gives them some sort of mystique. But my crown jewel of my collection, yeah, the thing that creeps out pretty much everybody that comes into my house, is the poltergeist clown. Many people look at that poltergeist clown and they think I'm completely out of my mind for having it in my house. That thing terrified them as a child. It terrified me. I don't necessarily like collecting some of the objects from horror films, even though I, I'm sure many people do, but I am a little bit addicted to going to the locations. Not just for the horror education that you get from it, but also for the history as well. 
And sometimes real life history does intersect with the making of the movie. A place takes on uh, a certain kind of personality just because a movie was shot there. Okay, Rob, that thing almost killed me. There's so many homes used in a horror film and then a buyer kind of unwittingly gets this home. And maybe they weren't aware of the fact that there were gonna be so many people who come to their house almost like a pilgrimage, you know? This is, it, it is almost like a religion. Hello, this is Ethan from Nubby Vision. I'm in front of the Freezing House, uh, which was featured in Poltergeist, my favorite horror movie of all time. Who knew that a regular residential area could turn into a horror film tourist location? The person that lives in that house now is the original owner, but they shot the film there before anybody had moved in. It was a brand new construction. And so when they bought it, I don't think they knew right away that that was the house from the film. Or maybe they knew and they just didn't think it'd be a big deal. Who would ever find out? The reason why I'm whispering is because I'm at the Poltergeist house and the garage door is open. There's a guy literally in his garage right there, so I'm trying to be quiet. When you visit these places, you feel like it's a house you grew up in, because in your mind, it's a memory. So I just became obsessed with it. My friend Darren and I found the street where the Myers house was. Hi, I'm Sean Clark. Today, I'm at the Myers house in South Pasadena, California. That started my obsession with filming locations. Hi, I'm Sean Clark, and today I'm standing in front of the house from Poltergeist. We're in Cuesta Verde, California, which is actually Simi Valley, California, where the house from the film Poltergeist was located. It's still here. It didn't get sucked into the ground like you saw in the film. The swimming pool was shot on a soundstage at MGM, but, you know, this house doesn't even have a swimming pool. The interior of this house wasn't actually used. It was all sets, and uh, just the exterior is what they used in the film and it's just a regular house. It's nothing scary about it, it's just suburbia. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> Hi. So now I'm with Richard Hallman, he's the next door neighbor. So tell me, when did you move in and when did you first find out this was the house from Poltergeist? I moved in in 2010, about eight years ago. It's fun, I, I love the people coming by and checking it out and mm -hmm. everybody's friendly, so it's, it's great. I do believe they shot at least a scene in the kitchen because looking into the backyard when they were supposedly right. making the swimming pool, because they um, did that, they made the pool. There is a pool. Yeah. So there is a pool. Okay, mystery There's solved. So I wonder if they did shoot that infamous scene with all the skeletons here. If that was, no, it was here. I, it no, was, it was here. here. No, it was here. Okay, yeah, so the here. curse could be real, and it might actually be this house. Like, you know, no, uh, seriously, yeah. There's some weird things that went on as far as like how many, you know, people, actors, things like that, that passed, passed away, away yeah. things like that. That's scary. You know, there was rumors that they used actual, some actual skeletons in that scene, and that might be part of the reason of the curses. So, who knows? I mean, I, you say yeah. that this guy is the original owner. He's been, in, he, nothing's happened to him yet, as far nope, as I know. No, he's still here, still going. So. The curse of Poltergeist is really fascinating because it's kind of this meta curse because it is mirroring what you're seeing in the movie and that does have a bigger impact. The house in the film is not only the source of all the supernatural troubles that haunt the Freeling family, but it's also the source of the problems faced by these real life homeowners thanks to a bunch of curious Poltergeist fans. And the same thing with the skeletons that are rising up from underneath the house if those are real, perhaps the people who are making the movie are making the same mistakes that the people in the movie are making, then it has this meta credibility to it. You son of a bitch, you moved the cemetery, but you left the bodies, didn't you? The thing is, if you talk to anyone who's around that tragedy, it's a it's a real and it's something that we forget. We try to mythologize it, but we forget that there are real people affected. I had an amazing relationship with Heather. I absolutely adored that little girl. I think it was after the first or second day of shooting, she came up to me and said, you know what, Gary, I really like the way you direct. And I, you know, I'm gonna be a director when I grow up. So I would like to study how you work. <laughs> I think Heather had a ball with the practical effects. It was like an amusement park ride for her. Especially that mirror, you know, when she locks fingers with her image in the mirror. We're back. And she loved it. She just thought that was the most fun in the world of riding up and down on this mirror. 
Heather had been ill before we started shooting, and her parents had been taking her to doctors. She was diagnosed as having Crohn's disease, and they were treating her for Crohn's disease, so she was on steroids, and I guess the only side effects were the chipmunk cheeks that she would develop sometimes. But unfortunately, they were treating her for something that she didn't have. We got a call one morning uh, that we were gonna have a conference call that afternoon, and the conference call was Heather's agent telling us that she had passed away that morning. It, my first reaction to hearing that, that Heather passed away was just total sorrow. Um, I, I just, I, I couldn't believe it. The mother of the star of the three Poltergeist movies has filed a wrongful death suit against the hospital and medical group that treated Heather. What they thought she had was a, a bowel uh, inflammation. What she actually had was an obstruction. It was a congenital birth defect, and she had an abscess in, in her intestines that had been collecting fecal matter and, and, and other toxic matter that had been growing in like this balloon on, on her intestines, and that morning um, it exploded. And basically she went into toxic shock, and that was, that was the end of it. And Alan Ladd Jr., he said, Gary, get on a plane. You gotta come back, we gotta have a meeting. We have a film that we have an ending that we're unhappy with. We were gonna shoot a new ending, and, and so I flew back to Los Angeles, and I, I wanted to be there anyways for the funeral, where I had been asked to be a pallbearer. We just decided in that room that day, the day before the funeral, that we were not gonna finish the film. Film's over. I can't go back into the cutting room or watch this film with this dead 11-year-old in it. Afterwards, the, the board at MGM just said to us, you're going to finish the film. We got a lot of money invested in the film. You're going to finish the film. You don't need Carol Ann. I can lead you into the light. I have the knowledge. So they said, you'll have to come up and do an ending that won't involve Heather. So we came up with the idea for the stupid ending that's on the film now and used the double for Heather. That was the creepiest thing I've ever gone through in my life. Having this little girl dressed up as Heather, keeping her face away from camera. I really just did not want to finish the film. None of us would go along with the studio and, and do any publicity for the release of the movie. None of us wanted the movie released, and uh, but it was. And I don't think any of us thought finishing the film would be a memorial to Heather. The only thing we did was uh, at, at the end of the film, there is a single card that says in memoriam to Heather O'Rourke. Which just makes it sadder. <laughs> in other showbiz news, as Poltergeist 3 opens around the country, the memory of Heather O'Rourke continues to make headlines. With the death of Heather O'Rourke and several other stars in the Poltergeist film, supermarket tabloids immediately began running stories of the films being jinxed. Following Heather's death, I was attacked by the, by the tabloid world. Um, they were outside my door. I couldn't pick up my phone without it being somebody from the National Enquirer or some other rag like that wanting to know, uh, you know, asking me questions about Heather's death and about the curse of poltergeist. I actually moved um, and changed my phone number Zelda Rubenstein got so fed up with people asking her to talk about it, she finally went on camera and did an interview. Zelda Rubenstein is in Poltergeist 3. We asked what she thought of the Jinx stories. Heather died uh, because of an undetected uh, con congenital anatomical defect. And Dominique Dunn died at the hands of a 
extremely ill-directed, passionate boyfriend. I think that it's pretty much a courtesy to put to an end this uh, superstitious um, crap. You know, it's possible if I had to do this all over again that I probably wouldn't have made the movie. Um, I, uh, but I, I, I don't think it had anything to do with a curse. I think people are always fascinated by the unknown. The fact that some people want to connect that with poltergeists and skeletons to each his own. I'm Craig Reardon, and I work in special makeup effects. And uh, in 1981, I worked on Poltergeist. But the subject of the skeletons that were used in Poltergeist, to my utter amazement, has created a sort of an online mythology, and not a pretty one. Apparently, there's a contingent of people out there who uh, believe that the fact that uh, real human skeletons were used are some kind of pretext to explain, air quotes, why uh, two actresses that worked in the film subsequently died, which is not only uh, just conceptually ridiculous, but uh, is personally offensive to me. Here's something I guess they don't know, and that's the fact that human skeletons have been used in movies for years and years. William Castle, who's a kind of a beloved figure, well, he makes a movie called House on Haunted Hill, and at the end of that movie, uh, Vincent Price makes a, a skeleton emerge from a vat of supposedly acid. The skeleton wobbles toward his virago of a wife. Well, I was a real skeleton, too. I was a skeleton rigged up as a marionette. There's a scene at the beginning of the 1931 movie Frankenstein where Fritz the Hunchback runs into a skeleton. I mean, you know, I hate to disillusion you. Those were real human skeletons because no low-budget B-film is going to pay anybody to sculpt a human skeleton when all you had to do was go to a biological supply house and get a human skeleton. You know, wake up and smell the budget. That's really the way it worked. The idea of having a few of them on the set of Poltergeist and killing two lovely young girls is a pretty pernicious idea. It's an insult to the memory of uh, a very sweet little girl, Heather O'Rourke. And uh, it's worse than that to Dominique Dunn, who was strangled to death by her boyfriend, which had fuck all to do with a skeleton. Life is full of really terrible tragedies and accidents. I think it's easier for people to try to explain away the kind of fragility of life and death if they can come up with some kind of larger reason for it, some kind of conspiracy theory that helps justify why this person is suddenly gone. I think it helps people cope in some ways too, if they can't accept the reality of it, because the reality is that anyone can leave us at any time, and that's sometimes too difficult to wrap our heads around.